so I actually began studying the software industry in 1985. And again, from my Japan background, I became interested in software development and the history of software engineering and began studying Japanese software factories. And before that, I had written a book on uh, the Japanese automobile industry and looked at the development of the Toyota production system, quality control, all sorts of other things, and was interested in seeing how well the Japanese could transfer some of their skills uh, in engineering and manufacturing or large-scale production to software. Over time, though, I guess particularly in the last uh, dozen years or so, I became interested also in what are some of the company strategies or business strategies behind software. I found the Japanese were excellent at process, had the best quality in the world, but they didn't know how to make money from software. So I decided to follow the money, so to speak, and uh, got an introduction to Microsoft and uh, ended up writing a book on Microsoft, 1995, called Microsoft Secrets. Then wrote another book on uh, Netscape in 1998 as the internet became important. That's in your library, actually. Uh, so since early and mid-90s, I've been looking much more at the connection between strategy and technology in this industry and how it's been changing. And uh, so uh, in the last few years, I tried to put my thoughts together and then in 2004 published another book called The Business of Software. Um, and that had followed a book on platform leadership and that had followed another book. So there's a bunch of things that I've been putting together. Um, and actually, all of these ideas will come together for the Clarendon Lectures, as Bill mentioned. And, uh, this will be May 11th at the Said School in search of best practice, enduring ideas and strategy, innovation, and technology management. Um, there's obviously not time to talk about that lecture. That lecture um, will come in May. But what I am talking about today is actually a small slice of what I will be talking about in this next book, uh, as well as in that lecture. OK. So, there's a, a more general problem that I've been interested in since, uh, since I had to rewrite the business of software book when the internet bubble burst, uh, which is another story. I was on my last sabbatical, 2000, 2001, and I had largely written a draft of a book about how you create a software company, software startup, again, building on the Microsoft and Netscape package software model. Then all of a sudden, that whole model implodes. Fortunately, I was on sabbatical, so I was able to sort of rewrite that manuscript um, and think a lot more deeply about business models and changes in the industry. And, and since that time, I've been concerned with what you might call this simultaneous uh, phenomenon, which is uh, we have commoditization in many markets going on at the same time that we have increasing demands for innovation. Um, and this is particularly the case in, at least I argue, in markets affected by digital technologies, which is another connection to your internet center. The internet has exacerbated all of these trends. In the hardware business, we're familiar with this from the 1960s, the price of computing power going down. Uh, software industry has actually held its value reasonably well uh, until, again, maybe the late 1990s, early 2000s. Uh, of course, you did have Microsoft coming in with much cheaper package software, but if you were an enterprise software company like an SAP or Oracle, you were still able to charge hundreds of thousands, even millions of dollars for any of these license fees uh, for, uh, for users in your company. So the, the value held pretty well, and then it started collapsing. And things like open, uh, open source and free software are part of that, but it's more of a general... I'll, I'll argue it's a general commoditization problem with these high technology products. Um, it's a good thing we don't have time for question and answers now. We'll do this later because this is sort of controversial, but, uh, but it's going on around us. And then if you look at China and India, we see other things going on. Uh, China, Chinese companies have developed the capabilities to manufacture or copy just about any high tech product. I spent several years uh, ago working with a company called Huawei. They bought 4,000 copies of my business of software book, hired 4,500 software engineers, and are basically ripping off all kinds of software from Cisco, other companies, selling it for a fraction, selling their hardware for a fraction of what Cisco would charge. 
I mean, that's commoditization. There's also some innovation there because they're doing a lot of neat things in value-added services with China Mobile and companies in Africa. So again, it's, it's an example. And their prices become the world's prices. Um, and in India, we have another issue. Uh, 20 years ago, is it 20 years ago now? It's 21 years ago. An Indian entrepreneur walked into my office at MIT holding a working paper I had written on the Hitachi software factory. And he said to me, I can do this in India. His name was uh, Narin Patni. He's the guy that actually started IT outsourcing in India. Uh, seven engineers had actually quit his company and formed another firm called Infosys because they thought Narin and his family were too slow to get into the software business full scale. But eventually he did, and that's a public company. I'm a director. I've been a director for the last five years. Uh, but their prices have become the world's prices for software and other high-tech services. So again, these are, these are additional dramatic changes if you are a, a manager or an entrepreneur in the software business. And the problem, again, is there's not a lot of room for error because, again, these prices, many prices have collapsed and margins have collapsed. So understanding these trends and what you can do about them is, is pretty critical. Um, this is just for your background. The, the software business that I'm talking about is, is really the business that uh, is measured by revenue. In other words, people are selling a packaged software product or they're selling customization or other kinds of services. Uh, and that whole software services industry, at least in 2007, was estimated to be about a, a trillion US dollars. Uh, the software products business, the Microsoft or SAP, or the product, actually the product and services side of SAP because they're just lumped together from the product company, is only about $200 billion. billion. So the industry, even at this time, is still only about 20% products, and the rest of it is really services of different types. So the software business we think of, uh, it's not really just Microsoft and Oracle and SAP. Services are a tremendous part of it and always have been, actually. So I'll actually make an argument that services are becoming even more important over time. And just uh, the U.S. is about half of this market in Europe and, and uh, the U.K. maybe about a third or a little bit less in Asia rising. Okay, so I'm talking about the commercial software industry. So my thoughts are that the software product business is an extreme example of this commoditization and innovation uh, trend. Uh, and the most obvious sign we can see of that is a fairly dramatic decline in sales from the, these product companies, the revenues attached or coming from product sales. We call them license fees. There are some exceptions. You'll always find some companies that come out with a hit product. There are some other what I call platform types of products like Microsoft Windows or, or some of the Adobe products that have ecosystems around them that continue to drive sales. In Microsoft's case, uh, a third or so of their sales are to PC manufacturers and they keep loading Windows, for example. There's a lot of uh, again, momentum to generate those sales. But most software product companies don't have that kind of uh, platform status. And most of them have seen their sales or their prices decline fairly dramatically. And we don't actually know if it's prices declining or, or unit sales declining. It really ends up being the same, the same thing. But offsetting it at some level, we see a growth in service service revenues, including maintenance. And maintenance is this annual percentage payments, usually between 15% and 25% of what the product price was. Uh, and these are payments made every year. And associated with maintenance is one of these wonderful words, at least in the software business, and that is uh, perpetuity. And usually, if you sell a software product and your customer pays you these annual maintenance fees, they have the right to use that software product in perpetuity. I think the second favorite word is monopoly in the software business. And I think both of these ideas are actually in some ways under threat uh, as we go forward. But maintenance has been very important as well as other kinds of services, which we'll call professional services. And I'll break it down in a moment. But we, we put them together because of accounting rules. 
These are revenues that are recognized over time as companies deliver upgrades within certain constraints or quality patches, technical support, that's all in the maintenance bucket. Um, and it's different from a product sale which is recognized immediately. Freeware and open source are driving some of these prices to zero. Customers are rebelling against costly products. This has again been going on particularly since the late 1990s. Right? If you're a software company and your competitor decides to give away what you've spent years and hundreds of millions of dollars building, your, your price goes to zero. Right? And this happened to Netscape and I was right there watching them as this happened. Uh, as Microsoft bundled uh, Internet Explorer with Windows. So this is not a new phenomenon. It's been going on for a while. But in response, we see some new pricing trends and business models appearing. And I'll, I'll go into some more detail on this in a, in a moment. Uh, software as a service you've heard of, which is really cheaper products, but it actually eliminates the idea of maintenance payments and it bundles some technical support and say a, a relatively cheaper monthly fee. By the way, when we see software as a service payments, we in my data, and I'll show you that a little bit later, we count it as a product payment, just priced in a different way. However, it is bundling some maintenance and it's getting increasingly difficult to separate out what is the product side of this and what is the service side. Um, we can talk more about that. But salesforce.com is, is one example. So, um, just to, so I know the audience here, how many of you have heard of Salesforce.com? Okay. How many of you have heard of cloud computing and the Amazon APIs around the cloud? Okay. All right. I don't have to explain any of this. Nicole, I noticed you didn't raise your hand, but that's okay. You'll, you'll be with us. Another model is free but not free. That's uh, when I did this book on Netscape in 1998, we wrote about two strategies for the Internet age. One was free but not free. The other was open but not open in terms of your platform. And as I write up the Clarendon lectures, I discovered another one looking at Apple. And that is closed but not closed. So uh, again, these are important strategies because they're different ways that companies figure out how to make money from this technology while pricing is going uh, in many directions around them. So software supported by advertising or services or, or what the economists will call a two-sided market. You give away one part of the platform, you charge for the other. Give away the browser, you charge for servers, for example. Or in Adobe's case, you give away the reader and you charge for editing tools or servers, right? So you don't have to charge both sides of the market. Or in Microsoft's case, you can give away the Windows software development kits, subsidize, subsidize developers, but um, you charge people for the applications or for the software platform, right? Or video game consoles, you sell consoles below cost and then you charge the game producers and you try to make your money on the software. So a lot of this is going around. These are different models. The advertising model, which you've heard a lot about for the last 10 years, if you look at it, it only seems to work in a few cases because everybody wants to go to a single portal and uh, you can't have hundreds or millions of portals making money from advertising. You have to have the right volume. So there's some network effects that actually limit the applicability of these models broadly. But nonetheless, these things are all happening and we are trying to understand what they're doing. Um, so these are a couple graphs and I'll show a couple of them which came from my uh, my business of software book um, and just showing what's happening in the industry to a company. So Siebel, how many of you have heard of Siebel? I would expect all the same hands that were up before to go up. Okay, They're the, essentially the inventor of the customer relationship management product. Keep track of your customers for sales leads and marketing. So on the top, and I think there is a pointer here. Yep. Uh, this just shows their absolute sales. So from the time they went public. Now, this product took off like a rocket and they went to more than $2 billion in sales, roughly divided between product revenues and here this is services including maintenance. And then all of a sudden after the collapse of the internet, these sales just, just imploded, dropped to half a billion dollars very quickly. And, and here they go through what I call the crisscross, 
where the service and maintenance revenues actually come to exceed the product revenues. So this pure product company, almost pure product company, pretty quickly becomes really a service and maintenance company, which has dramatic implications for the company, the way it's managed, its profitability, its growth rates, all sorts of things, including its stock price, which absolutely collapsed um, because analysts love companies that are growing at this rate. And when they're doing this, that's when stock prices go from $100 to $1 or $2. Um, the worst thing, though, was that Siebel thought this would go on forever. So in their planning, they had, you know, they were drawing forecasts that went up here. And when this happened to them, they had to fire half of the company. They lost hundreds of millions of dollars. They ended up selling themselves to Oracle. So they don't even exist anymore. The bottom chart sort of maps out this history looking at the percentages of their revenues. And of course, they're symmetrical, the this new product revenues versus the service and maintenance revenues. So when Siebel first went public, 95% of their revenues were coming from the product side. And this, these were the glory days, tremendous profits, tremendous growth potential. But gradually, they creeped forward to this point, and they went through this crisscross and became a service and maintenance company. OK, so I drew this graph. I actually drew about 10 of them. Um, in my last book, and that was the wrong button to push. OK. This is Oracle, which you can see grew OK, and their, their product sales plateaued. Services and maintenance kept going up. Um, this jump here is because of all the acquisitions they started to make, including Siebel, not from anything that Oracle itself did. And you can see the bottom here, this sort of nice cross I think of this like a, as a, like a DNA chart of a software product company. I can look at this and almost immediately get some sense of what the company is like. And the other interesting thing about this, if you draw enough of these charts, you begin to look into the future. You can sort of, particularly if you were back here drawing them and you knew enough about what was happening, you could actually predict pretty well what would happen in the future. Oh, maybe not over here. Maybe over here you could predict it. At least I think you could predict it, because this is very, very common in the industry. Um, so um, I'm going to get more. I'm going to get back to that data pretty quickly, but here is a little bit more detail about what we're talking about. So when we say maintenance, it's largely these annual payments plus technical support bundled into this usually annual payment. And then there's all sorts of professional services that are in there. Um, consulting, you know, trying to help the customer figure out what to do, training, customization, new features, special user interfaces, those kinds of things, and then actually installing the system. And then we've seen some other kinds of services come about, uh, leasing the software uh, or utility kind of on-demand computing. If it happens here, though, we count it as a product because it's really just pricing the product differently. And then there could be some outsourcing services that the, a company would provide to the customer, hosting, for example. So these are the kinds of services that uh, companies have been reporting. And it's mostly what we're tr we've been tracking as services and maintenance, um, this side, these things over here, versus the product revenues, which could be some of this. So in the business of software, I drew this graph. And again, thinking about companies like Oracle and saying to myself, well, I, I, I think this could be a life cycle model for software product companies. And maybe it applies to other companies as well. That once they come into the market fairly quickly, um, other companies copy their products or prices start falling for some other reason. And over time, the installed base starts building up, the, particularly these maintenance payments. And they end up really flipping around and being a services and, and maintenance company. And I had a chart in the book showing, you know, for every dollar of product license fees, most enterprise software companies get uh, about three dollars of services for installation, training, et cetera. And that lasts about two to three, two to three years. Then they get the annual maintenance payments, usually 15 to 25 cents on the dollar. So over time, if you don't get new customers, you're going to end up over here. And it's very hard to keep getting new customers, right? 
and it's also very hard to keep charging a lot of money for this. Over time, these prices in the computer industry in general fall over time. That's one of the characteristics of, of the digital technology. So I propose this, and I do know that occasionally you find it flipped around. I have worked with some companies that start out with some technology. They haven't fully productized it yet, and they start out really as consultancies. I2 Technologies and Supply Chain Software was one company that did that. And then they package it, and then they sell it, and they flip around so they can start in services. But I have the data that will show most companies actually who claim to be software product companies do start out with product companies and they have a little bit of service and maintenance revenue. So um, this gets into a much larger debate in the software business about is it better to be a products company or a services company. And I've been teaching a course uh, at MIT since 1997 on how to well, it's called the software business. And largely, I've been teaching my students, you want to create a software product company. You want to be like a Microsoft or a Netscape. That's where the money is. And the services side is very different. The business models, strategies, the kind of capabilities are very, very different. Right? So uh, trying to sell your services to General Motors versus uh, trying to sell a product, a horizontal product around the world is a very different kind of thing, different kind of selling, different kind of engineering, um, and very different kind of productivity and profit margins. So the basic uh, logic, I think, has been that it's really hard to be great at, at both, and you really do need to make a choice. Uh, one of my favorite quotes was from Scott McNeely when he was CEO in, in uh, 2004, which I think was a very typical view of services in high-tech companies. That, Services will be the graveyard for old tech companies that can't compete. Uh, and it's, it's, it's interesting. And I also think this is an empirical question that we can study. Um, but um, as you, you might know that Scott was very quickly kicked upstairs to the chairman's office. And a software and services guy was brought in and made head of, head of Sun. Uh, and it's largely, but he might actually be right. So his basic argument is if your technology has gotten to the let's say the commoditization point where you can't charge much money for it and all you're left with is services, what is your future? Your future may very well be oblivion. Now, we do have some examples where the opposite seems to have occurred and I'll get to that a little bit later, hopefully, but IBM is one. But it's an interesting proposition and uh, I've actually have some data on it. But I think what Scott has in mind um, are the something we'll call the gross margins of, of the product business. And again, an extreme example of that is the software product business. So this is some data from a French company I worked with for five years as a consultant, Business Objects, recently bought by SAP for $6.2 billion, a very nice sum. Um, and as this company grew from roughly, uh, I guess, about $40 million dollars in sales when they first went public in the early 90s to about, at this point, about $400 million in sales. Their gross margins on their product went from around 90%, 92% to really 99%. Their gross margins on services and maintenance dropped from about 70 to 60%. And if you can have 99% gross margins, right, it's, it's one of these wonderful things, right, in life, in the world. Now, how many of you know what gross margin does not include? No accountants in the room? Bill, you don't even know what a gross margin is. Well, it's, it's, it's basically your revenues minus your direct cost for producing the product, and that's your gross margin. So in an automobile company, your direct costs of producing every product are high. They're very high, right? But in software, the marginal cost of, of producing the product is almost zero. There are some costs associated with licensing, um, maybe with packaging the product in days past, but with electronic distribution, it's almost zero. But the funny thing of this number is that a gross margin does not include stuff below that line, which is R&D costs, sales and marketing, general administrative stuff. At below that, 
then you would get to something like operating profits, and then you pay your taxes, amortization, and then you would get to net profits. So this is a higher level number, but people watch it closely because you can manage some of these other things. You can manage R&D, sales, and marketing, right? And you can't uh, always manage your direct costs. So this is the great magic of the software products business. This is the, the Microsoft secret. Again, we, I wrote a book called Microsoft Secrets. If you can, if you can get your scale up high enough, your R&D costs or marketing costs are trivial compared to what you can make. And that's why we talk of the Windows license as essentially a license to print money. It's a hundred dollar bill. It's no different from the US Federal Treasury. It really isn't. And this is why product manage, uh, I mean companies, product, people want to be in product companies essentially, if you can do it. And again, the trick is you don't want to overspend too much on R&D or sales and marketing. Okay, so that's the great side. But, and this, is, this was the story of the first version of the business of software before the internet bubble collapsed and I rewrote the book with the subtitle, How to Thrive and Survive in Good Times and Bad Times. Because this works with good times. But there's all sorts of other things about the product business in software and other digital businesses in particular that I guess were not so apparent in the wonderful days. First thing is, I think is more common sense, it's hard to create a bestseller, right? And the publishing people know this very well. There are thousands of books published, only one or two of them become bestsellers. The publishers, if they get those blockbusters, they can make all their money back, but from the individual writer's point of view or entrepreneur's point of view, it's tough to have that bestseller. So that's one problem. The other one is commodities. I mentioned uh, a supply chain software company. When I was working with them in 2000, they were able to charge one and a half million dollars for their basic bundle, their basic license bundle. By 2004, they were only getting $250,000 for exactly the same set of software. As a matter of fact, it was better. It was, the quality was better, there were more features, and it was dramatically priced lower. Today, it's probably half that price. And at some point in the future, it'll probably be zero because SAP has essentially bundled supply chain management software in its back office stack, so the incremental price is zero. And when that happens to you, you have to figure out another business model. If you have a platform play, you can do something like that, or you live off of services and maintenance from your existing stalled base. Uh, discretionary spending, this is what happened to Siebel as well as I2. When the bad economic times occurred, this is like what's occurring now, people just stopped buying technology. You know, I'll, I used my Windows 95 laptop for seven years, I think, until my IT people said, I'm going to kill you if you don't buy a new computer. So I finally bought a new computer. But uh, a lot of people did the same thing I did. So product prices can collapse. They can just fall right off a cliff, whereas services usually are engaged through longer-term contracts. And particularly if you have these perpetual maintenance contracts, you're going to get a revenue stream that's pretty steady, right? And it may actually have pretty good gross margins, too, if you don't have a lot of technical support. Um, and that's what we actually saw after the, uh, the internet boom and bust. There is some downward pressure on these, such as from India. The other thing I realized that had not occurred to me before, and this was again reflecting on the business objects, the 99% gross margins, is uh, 99% of zero is zero. I mean, it just never occurred to me. I've been studying the industry for 15 years, and that never occurred to me. But it's actually very powerful. Okay. And that's why Netscape sold itself, and that's why a lot of startups that I worked with never went anywhere. They couldn't get anybody to buy their product. Or if some, some guy in Finland decided to do the same thing and give it away for free, right? Not, not that they have anything against Finland. Okay. So in response, at least partially, I mean, fortunately human beings are fairly creative and they've come up with some different ways of figuring out how to make money, which is a business model. Some of my students, uh, Few year, a few years ago drew up this chart, which I think is absolutely wonderful. So I, I keep using it. Um, and the dimensions of change have been along the revenue model, 
how you're delivering the software, and also the kinds of customers you can get. So the traditional model was that big upfront license fee. You install the software on your, your customers' uh, machines. And largely, it's very expensive for enterprise software. So you basically can only get these mainstream consumers or big enterprises. But the revenue models have changed. Software as a service subscriptions, which are largely cheaper. Advertising base, which is sort of free to the user. It's free but not free. The advertisers pay. Transaction based. The free but not free is a model. So Internet Explorer is free. Media Player is free. A bunch of different servers are free. They're bundled on top of another product. Or a lot of SAP modules are essentially free. They're bundled with the back office suite. And then you have uh, completely free, like open source free software, and companies make money from services. So the revenue model is really a lot more diversified than it was 10, 15 years ago. Uh, the delivery model has also changed from uh, you know, hosting software, from remote servers, web-based. Uh, so a lot of this has been going on. And again, the internet has made this possible. Uh, and then we're finally getting to another model where people are putting software back into a box. We we'll call it the sort of the, uh, the pizza box model or the uh, um, there's other, there's other terms that people are using, but um, a lot of companies have recognized that people don't want to pay money for software, but they will pay money for a box. The price of a box won't fall to zero. So Cisco keeps most of its software in a box. A lot of, almost all of its software could run on a general purpose computer. They don't have to sell you these routers and these other boxes. Or if you buy phishing filters or other kind of email servers or souped up blade servers. Well, the blade servers are hardware, but a lot of the software that is bundled with it doesn't really have to be with it. But people do that because they can charge money for it. It's sort of a decommoditization strategy. The other wonderful thing is that with cheaper software or, or different kinds of models of pricing it and easier ways of delivering it. You don't have to have an army of 10,000 service technicians installing software machine by machine, right? Or even server by server. You just download it off the web. So you can go to different kinds of consumers, early adopters, small businesses. The, high, the hottest market now in the software business is small and medium-sized companies. And we're selling them enterprise class software very cheaply. Not making much money from it, but companies are selling it. So, all these revolutions in business models are going on. One of my students also did a survey of, of uh, companies that were selling enterprise class software, but at least had, uh, had a web-based offering. They weren't just selling it off of disks, for example. And we do see quite a rise in the number of these companies, despite the, the collapse of the internet here in some trough in uh, in entrepreneurship. So there are a lot of these new companies trying these new business models. Uh, from that same sample, uh, we saw different pricing models. The old traditional license fee was fairly low down in priority. The most popular pricing model was a monthly subscription fee for these web-based software, enterprise software companies. So these are just some examples of the kinds of changes going on. Now, the big questions. <laughs> are a little bit more serious. And that is really, is this rise in services and new business models a, a temporary phenomenon, or is it really a permanent phenomenon? So the, the temporary argument is that we're really in some kind of transition phase between maybe platform technologies. And if we do have enough innovation in the platform, we might very well see a big rise again in product sales. And you could argue we're in some transition now between maybe internet and web services or something of that sort. Um, another possibility is that the transition we see is permanent. Um, software and digital goods are commoditized. The future of software products essentially is free but not free or some other kind of pricing model. Any kind of commodity product, the price, if it's digital based, the price will fall to zero and uh, many other technology-based industries may actually follow. Temporary versus permanent. Now, usually at this point, <clears throat> I ask, how many of you vote that this is a temporary phenomenon? And permanent? Okay. 
And then I, I, for a while I stopped asking this question when someone said to me, how long is temporary? <laughs> and I didn't have an answer for that, so I stopped asking the question. But now I'm asking it again because I, it's, you know, I, I guess, and then someone to me, said to me the other day that if, if you can sort of foresee the future, then it's probably temporary. But temporary is, you know, years, maybe a decade, but, but uh, generation or, I mean, uh, at some point this may very well change. But it, it's hard to argue that this is, not, this is not permanent. However, I do have a former student, research colleague now, who when the Apple iPhone came out, he stood, I think he stood online overnight and then paid $600 for this little box, which is worthless without software and content and internet services. Nonetheless, <clears throat> that made me think that maybe it is temporary. That if we actually do get real excitement again in the product field, like we had with the iPhone, we could have a whole rush of value back to the product, back to the boxes. It doesn't have to be permanent. But there's some question there. And I actually thought it could be an empirical question. We could try to actually study this and look at history and try to get some sense of what's happened in the past and project it a bit to the future. I want to throw in quickly a little bit of theory, though, that might actually apply to this. Now, how many of you have heard of the product process innovation life cycle? A few of you. OK. And it's the idea that early in the life cycle of an industry, companies focus mostly on getting the product design right. Competition is around the product. Once that's standardized, you know, four wheels, metal cab, round steering wheel, rubber tires, gasoline combustion engine, then the shift in attention is to how do you make this product more efficiently. You have, you know, uh, transfer equipment, automation, mass production, okay, the Ford system. Well, it's possible that what we are seeing is we've gone through this in software. We had a lot of competition over figuring out what is a software operating system, what is an application. Then we actually had software factories, and I know we have them because I spent many years studying them. And they exist in India today as well as in Japan. And that was largely about structuring the process of developing software. Um, packaging software is, is another part of, of, of a process innovation as well as a product innovation. It could be that companies are now just shifting their attention to how do you make money from services because they've sort of gotten all the leverage they can from process innovation and product innovation. But if the platform generation we're involved in changes, then this whole cycle could start over again. So you can argue there was this kind of cycle in mainframes. Most the Japanese software factories were only good for making mainframe software. When client server appeared, they were hopeless because all their data and management procedures and reuse libraries and computer-aided tools were all geared to using languages like COBOL and PL1 and stuff like that, and they, they weren't good for, for anything else. But Again, this could be PC, internet era, and there could be some other era. The other idea is that we're in between platform generations and services appear in between these generations. So for example, the shift from mainframe to distributed computing client server created tremendous opportunities for services. People needed to rewrite their applications, port their data, retrain their people. They needed consultants to tell them, how do we use these new machines, right? So it actually may create more revenues on the service side. So we might see product revenues declining and services and maintenance going up. It could be part of a generational change. Um, and new business models become enabled by some of these new technologies. And the last one, the internet, wireless computing, has enabled all sorts of new business models. Transaction-based pricing, for example, as well as web-based delivery. These are all things only possible uh, in, in the recent internet platform. So it could be this is what we're seeing. And the product process service lifecycle could repeat itself in each one of these generations. So again. I don't know if this helps with permanent or not. Or, uh, but what I wanted to do was collect some data on this. So what I did, after I got tired of drawing these graphs one company at a time, I collected a couple of my doctoral students and said, I want to create a database of every software product company ever founded on the history of the Earth, and I want their complete data. 
And by the way, do it also for IT services companies and any industrial company that reports product and service revenue because I'd like to compare the trends. So that was 2003. And we've, it took us quite a few years. And I'll just talk a little bit about the public software company data. We have about 500 companies. These are, we took, we ended up limiting the sample to US stock exchanges. So there's about 500 companies, about 3,000 observations. Uh, we ended up going back to 1990 for the data because before that it has to, it all has to be downloaded manually. So we, are, we have some limits there, although we should really go back further. And then we created the other two databases as well. So now what we actually see, this is what the number of firms look like. So 1990, when the data begins, there were roughly about 140 publicly listed software product companies. This is Microsoft, including SAP. If it's listed on US stock exchanges, it's, even if it's a foreign company, it's there. Uh, the peak was roughly at the peak of the internet, 1998. And then it's been downhill since then. So there's been a massive consolidation. And it goes on. We're updating the data every two years. It, the, year, the data lags about a year and a half as well. Oracle alone bought 20 software product companies just in the last couple of years. And that's an example of the consolidation. So there's really is some, and this is a sign generally of commoditization too. Here's the next graph trying to test my crisscross graph. And you need to look at this carefully because it took us four years to draw this graph. Um, I still remember the day when my student Steve generated it and we could look at it. Did it crisscross? Yes, it did. But as you can see, it didn't keep going down. It sort of leveled off. So this was the entire sample. And SAS is counted as product revenue. And again, the services are uh, professional and maintenance. So I don't know if you can actually see the colors from there. Well, I guess it, you don't have to actually see the color. But it does crisscross. 2002 was the magical point. Um, it'll be one of these great years in history. Maybe not. Um, by the way, if we take out, uh, if we put in video games, it g gets a little bit messier. Because it turns out video games are the last bastion of pure 100% package software companies. And not even Microsoft is 100% pure package software anymore. It has about 5 or 6% revenues from services. So it, it, it jumbles around a little bit. Maybe I should stand over here and get out of people's ways. So it's not quite this simple because this actually does vary a little bit by segment. There's all sorts of interesting things you can do when you have this kind of data. Um, so this is not historical. This is just a histogram of the whole sample. But you can see. These are, these are the number of times in the sample since 1990 that companies have reported 100% product revenues in any given year. Microsoft went public in 1986. The data goes through 2006. I think through 2006, they were 100%. So that's what, 18 times? So Microsoft appears in this column 18 times. Adobe's in there 15 times. And you add them up, the software product uh, companies. Uh, the total number has changed over time, but as of 2006, there were only about eight or so pure software product companies publicly listed. Most of the other 140 or so companies were somewhere along this spectrum. And here, these are companies that 66 times in any given year, they reported 100% service revenue, zero new product revenue. So here is the oblivion that Scott McNeely was referring to. And we've actually tracked this. If you end up here, most likely you will be going, you will be bankrupt or absorbed by someone else. This is not a healthy place to be. Um, but somewhere in here actually is quite healthy. And it's, this is what changes our thinking about what is a healthy business model for a software product company because it's extremely rare to be up here and to stay here. And most companies gravitate towards this middle hybrid position. And again, it's change the way we think about how you create and build a sustainable software company. Crisscross point was 20 or so years. If you can stay in business 20 years or so, uh, you will most likely hit this crisscross and become oriented towards services and maintenance. And you can see in the beginning, most companies had uh, primarily product revenue, even the startups. 
varies a little bit by segment. The business applications guys like SAP, they go through the purest crisscross. Um, some companies like Net Novell does a lot of packaging and networking. Uh, these companies have resisted it until lately, but then you see some points where the prices really drop. 2000 seems to be one mark where prices really fell, where people stopped buying new product and services maintenance really went up. Um, same thing with the business intelligence, uh, even the database software. Again, this 2000 is a pretty significant year. Then you see some other areas, operating systems. There's actually about 10 different companies around the world that sell different kinds of operating systems. Some of them are embedded software or real-time systems. Uh, and they've, they haven't gone through the crisscross, but the services and maintenance levels have crept up. This could be more just a change in pricing. Um, but again, if we think it's a product pricing change, we, we count it on the product side. But the thing with pricing is that companies can play like a shell game. They can discount the product price, but charge full maintenance fees or full service fees. So it becomes like, a again, a shell game. And we also think this is happening. OK. Um, there's all, you know, we've run regressions year after year. There's an age factor here, so you really can't factor in age. But largely, it's associated with slowing new sales, some consolidation, and price falling. And that seems to be why that, that second line creeps up. There is a healthy model. I think it's, it's pretty unlikely firms can grow the product side forever. But healthy synergy between the two, products and services, seems to be uh, uh, a very healthy model and profitable. Um, the unhealthy model is when companies go through the crisscross because their product business collapses. Either the price goes to zero or people just stop, stop buying the new product. So we have both of these cases explaining the crisscross phenomenon, but one is, is actually much better than the other. And you don't really know which one you're looking at until you look at the financials of the company. Um, some other data here, 70% is actually the optimal level for profitability for a software product company. If you can get 70% of your revenues from the product side, you are at the optimal profitability. It's not 100%, actually, because if you're at 100% product sales, you have very lumpy sales. It's a sort of a hit product phenomenon. It's 99% of zero is zero phenomenon sometimes. You're overspending on marketing and, and R&D sometimes. So, Having some recurring revenue base is actually a very good thing for a software company. Um, the other finding is that services had a negative impact on operating profits until they reached about 60% of sales. Then they turned profitable. So for a product company, again, Scott McNeely, disliking services, he's actually right. But at some point in the history of these firms, services become very important. And when it reaches this level, they become the bread and butter for generating revenues and profits. And that's when they have to start taking them seriously. Or maybe it's the reverse. That's when they do start taking them seriously. I can show you this next graph here. So going through my graph, services are negative here until they reach about a 60% threshold. And uh, again, I counsel companies that instead of putting, uh, putting you know, burnt out engineers and burnt out marketing guys in services, you need to treat it strategically. And companies like Oracle and SAP have actually done that. Uh, another point, uh, maintenance is much more profitable than professional services. And if you can actually increase every 10% increase in maintenance as a percentage of the service maintenance bucket is associated with a 5% increase in the gross margins for that bucket. So this is just the, it varies a little bit by, by segment. Um, multimedia tools and operating systems have no inflection point where services become profitable. So if you are in those segments, you should try to stay a, a product firm and forget about services. Um, and maybe services are a sign that your product isn't working very well. Okay. Uh, the other thing here is the other change in the business is that because services have become so important to the product firms, we now have sort of a battle going on. We have this huge industry of IT services company, which I showed you earlier, is, is really 80% of the whole industry. And now those guys are fighting with the product firms for the same services pie. 
and it's money on the table that the product companies have not bothered to take for many years. But now that product revenues are dropping and prices are dropping, they're going after those services strategically. And again, some companies have done that for years. Oracle started that in 1996, 97. SAP has been doing it. But now everybody's doing it. So this is the, the graph for the software IT, the IT service companies, which is Accenture, for example, Infosys. And the, their rise and fall is even steeper. So you can see they really went, uh, really had a grand time with the internet boom. And they've been collapsing and consolidating just as fast. Now we can also see for non-software companies, um, and I've been tracking some of them. Again, we have a third database looking at these firms. It could be they're in a different life cycle. A lot of these firms find that they're already at the point where their hardware is commoditized and their profit margins are higher on services. And again, that's sort of the IBM story. If we updated this, they would be up to about 60% or higher revenues from services today. And they've been systematically selling off their commodity hardware businesses over the last decade, starting under Lou Gerstner and focusing on software products, but more than that, professional services and different kinds of services, some of them tied to their software products and hardware, some of them not. So even Sun is here. Let's go back here. Sun is from you know, zero services, sorry. Zero services back here, or zero reported services. Services are now about a th were a third of the company's revenues in 2005. And without services, I think you can bet that Sun Microsystems would be pretty much dead. All right, so just to wrap up, we're in equilibrium here. We're not really at a point where the product business has collapsed, but the hybrid business model has clearly become the way to go. It's still product-oriented for the product companies, but they really do have to figure out how to manage services and maintenance. And until they get to about 60%, they seem to be losing money. I think the, key other, the other key idea here is that products are still the engine driving services and maintenance. If your product business goes to zero, you end up in the far right-hand corner. And according to other analyses we've done, you, you fade into oblivion. You end up, you exit from our database. Um, and then there's more of this competition and service capabilities between the hardware firms and the systems firms and the product firms with the IT services firms. The way I describe this is really three challenges for the hybrids. And one is how they manage this crisscross, figure out what is the optimal level uh, of, of service revenue, main, other, other kinds of services like maintenance and the product revenue for their segment, and how do they keep investing enough in products to keep that service and maintenance engine going. You don't want to overinvest in products. That's another factor we've seen, one of the major reasons why product companies go out of business is they overspend on R&D and sales and marketing. It's the 99% of zero is zero phenomenon. If people don't buy your product, all that money is wasted. The other things are how do you servitize products and productize services, and that is you know, how do you create those special value opportunities for your product, and then how do you figure out how to deliver those services efficiently. And you know, one approach, if you're doing customization, is the software factory approach. And that's what the Indian companies have essentially done. They figured out, like the Japanese did before them in the mainframe area, ways of delivering custom solutions very efficiently. The other way to do it is to do what a Google does or Amazon. You have a service, but it's fully automated. So a fully automated digital service is like the modern version of a software product today. So this is another way of delivering what we used to do, what we used to sell as separate software products, right? And that's essentially what we see Google doing. All right, I think I should end here. <laughs>